What's up guys, welcome to Daily Dose of Reddit, this is your host, Zach, and today's subreddit is r slash pro revenge. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode. This story's called, The Time I Got My Manager a Promotion So He Quit. I'm gonna have to be a little vague on some details to protect myself here so I can't discuss the type of business, etc. So it's gonna be a struggle. This is a lot of background to explain the kind of situation that developed over a decade. A place that was once truly fun to work at and easy to earn a bit of extra overtime became a dog-eat-dog -dog struggle to survive. The low-level peons like me were split between those who felt disenfranchised and hated by the management those that were basically looking for an escape route, and that group of snakes who would smile to your face and act sympathetic to your situation before sneaking away to inform the manager of anything they had learned which might have value. We were in a specific area of business that was isolated and slowly being replaced by technology. So from over a thousand in our building, it dropped to just around 250 when I left. Most of this was done through voluntary redundancy, but the managers were given incentive to fire as many as possible to save money on VR. And since manager jobs were also slowly being cut, they were desperate to fire as many as possible, but most were incapable of following procedure. Mike was that intelligent and brutal kind of manager who, like the others, had been promoted into the position, but knowing he wouldn't get trained officially, took it upon himself to become competent. The man had gotten dozens of people fired directly and more indirectly by helping less competent managers follow the correct procedure. A certain quantity of work at a certain level of quality was required, which everyone met. Yet they had a bottom and top 10 list, and if you were at the bottom 10 list, your job was on the line, regardless if you met the basic requirements. Since there was always a bottom 10 by definition, there were always 10 people on the firing line. This might be vague, but it has to be. Mike's team was a sort of clearinghouse for the bottom 10. We were shifted between shifts and teams for various reasons, but what I quickly learned is that somehow the shifts bottom 10 were all on Mike's team. Now, my performance was consistently in the top 10, so I was safe on that count, but my attendance was low due to health issues and my attitude was really bad. I also learned that the rest of the team was made up of people who weren't low in performance, but had low attendance and attitude problems just like me. And we had all been on the chopping block by managers who failed to follow procedure. In short, Mike was the executioner of the workforce. The most vulnerable to being fired were shifted around to his team so he could succeed where others have failed. Sooner or later, my time came. My health caused a series of absences while I had hospitalizations, and Mike pounced into action. In the space of a year, he made seven attempts to fire me, and each time I involved HR, who stepped in and protected me. I approached HR to make a case that what was happening was wrong, not just to me, but to everyone. I made the case that the situation of Mike being the executioner created a hostile work environment, and the fact that I had gotten his attempts to fire me thrown out proved that he was not only hostile, but was actively toxic. That it was against the law to discriminate on age or disability and a myriad of other arguments. I was told that there was nothing they could do. Mike was untouchable and had the full support of upper management in our building because he was saving a lot of money in voluntary redundancy payouts by firing the vulnerable. Legally, there might be a case, but it would have to go through a court system and not through HR unless I had an example of him being hostile and abusive. The person I spoke to was very sympathetic and he suggested I look into some things related to job opportunities that were coming up. He mentioned that many of them were managerial positions because a new type of roaming manager had been introduced. These were very needed and weren't getting much interest. Think substitute teacher where a manager gets sent all around the country at the drop of a hat. It didn't occur to me instantly, but weeks later, as I sat at work listening to Mike talk about his family, it clicked into place and my plan began to take form. Instead of making a complaint, I gave a glowing review and had several others do the same. If we couldn't get the man fired for his actions, 
we could get him promoted into a job that he couldn't take. The managers in our area were not even being considered for transfers because they lacked the training and qualifications to be managers anywhere else. Our reviews might just push him over the line into getting a promotion. And since roaming managers were being sought, the two should dovetail nicely. We didn't give the reviews to our management, but directly higher up the food chain, way above anyone that ever dealt with our area of the business. Each of us mentioned that Mike had done an amazing job at sorting out problems, etc., had great managerial skills and an in-depth knowledge of procedure. Then we sat back and waited. A few months went by with nothing happening and I thought the attempt had failed, but then we came in to Mike losing his mind. He was shouting at the shift manager, his boss, about how he wasn't being given a choice. Turns out, the higher management had gotten our reviews, looked into his record, and decided he was a perfect fit for the roaming manager position, and since they were in the process of getting rid of managers in our area, they insisted that Mike be pushed into it. Mike had, of course, tried to refuse the promotion, as was his right, but the higher management had made it a choice of accept the promotion or be demoted back to peon. Mike had a family and couldn't just uproot them whenever the company needed him elsewhere, and a demotion with a pay cut back into the workforce of people who despised him and that were slowly being culled was just as bad. So he asked for voluntary redundancy instead and was accepted. His last day, he went berserk, shouting and swearing about how badly the company had treated him after all he had done. I was unfortunately absent for it, but got a play-by-play -play and loved every second of it. Since I was told explicitly that I couldn't get him punished or fired, I got him a promotion he couldn't accept instead. Hey, that was pretty good thinking there. Instead of dragging him back down the mountain, you just pushed him off the cliff. Or you made his only options jump off the cliff or go back down the mountain to a lower cliff and then jump. Some sort of analogy with a cliff and a mountain slope going down thing might work here. I don't know. This story's called Company Recruits Me for Senior Position, Brings Me to Their HQ, Project gets cancelled while I'm interviewing, and I'm supposed to pay for the trip? I don't think so. Was reading a post in another subreddit regarding things that cost you to walk out of an interview, and it reminded me of this experience I had 20 plus years ago. Hope it fits here. During the dot-com boom in the late 90s, I became somewhat well-known for my expertise with a now somewhat obsolete networking technology. I ended up getting heavily recruited by a big telecom firm in Denver to run the technical side of a huge networking project they had underway. After multiple phone interviews, I was invited out for the big in-person sit-down, a two-day affair where I met the big dogs, other techies, HR, etc. It was a pretty killer opportunity. Took the trip, first day of meetings went great. I felt it was a great match, etc. I did sense there was some tension between two groups over network architecture. Turned out that was one of the reasons they were bringing in someone more senior who could finalize the approach and get the project moving. That was all fine, all part of the job, whatever. Got wined and dined after the first day, was definitely feeling like the job was a match and that I'd be moving to Denver. Went in the second day and after another round of interviews, the division head takes me to lunch. That's when it all blew up. While we were at lunch, the firm's senior management canned the entire project and fired every person associated with it. Apparently, there was a huge internal political war going on. This project was ground zero for the big battle and this division just lost. We get back from lunch and the manager escorts me to HR where we're gonna sit down and go over their offer. Instead, he's told what's going on and that he's out of a job along with everyone else on the project. At this point, I was told to leave. No apologies, it was just crappy luck for me. Okay then, I'm gone. I get back to the hotel and there's a voicemail asking for me to call the HR people. I'm pissed, but I call. They tell me they've had to cancel my return ticket and that I'd need to pay for the hotel myself for now. But that if I would submit an expense report, they might be able to get me a check. There's a second voicemail from the front desk asking me to provide a credit card for the stay. And then I get a call on my cell phone from the car rental company, which I didn't answer. Turns out they also wanted my credit card. Screw that. 
I called the airline and they said my reservation had indeed been cancelled, but they also acknowledged that the reservation was paid for using a fully refundable ticket, which I was holding and which back in the 90s was essentially as good as cash. Said they wouldn't know for certain if I could board until I showed up at the counter with the physical ticket. Great. Just freaking great. I'm on the hook for several thousand in airfare, nice hotel, and rental car after taking several days of vacation for my job for this interview? I don't think so. Here's the revenge. I packed my bags and loaded up the rental car, left the keys in the hotel room door, drove the rental car back to Dallas, stayed overnight in Amarillo, dropped the rental at the Hertz lot at the Dallas-Fort Worth airport, took their shuttle to the terminal I'd left my car at, and drove home. Over the next few months, I got several nasty phone calls from their HR and accounting departments, demanding I pay them back for the trip, including paying for the $700 drop-off fee for the car. Never answered them, of course, just let them go to voicemail. Eventually, I got a demand letter from their legal department, paid an attorney a nominal fee to send them a demand for compensation slash threaten a lawsuit letter. Never heard from that firm again. Side note. The ticket itself was still valid. I ended up selling it to a friend at a big discount and he was able to use it. Man, anytime I hear people not getting intimidated by people demanding money from them and, you know, getting a lawyer or getting a letter from their lawyer or legal department, I guess. Like, that crap would freak me out and I'd think I was gonna get in trouble and I would end up actually paying it, <laughs> um, because I guess I'm a naive little kid. So stories like this, they're always really cool to me because I am not that uh, sure of myself. <laughs> this story's called, Today I fudged up by grooming myself on a flight and shaving my beard only to trigger the crew's anti-tear training and make everyone super paranoid for a short while. This happened a while ago while I was traveling to the US on a 9 hour flight from Europe. Context: I'm Greek Lebanese and am a rather moderately hairy person, most of it on my face. I had an important meeting to attend in the US that was happening a few hours after I land, so I had to freshen up and prepare while on the plane still. A few hours into the flight, I went to the bathroom to change my clothes, wash my face, and freshen up shave and trim my beard, put on some deodorant, etc. Took my backpack with me since I've got everything in there. After spending some five minutes in there, struggling to move around in the tiny bathroom stalls on planes, someone knocks on the door. I brushed it off with something along the lines of, I'll be right out. I thought someone needed to use the bathroom, but it was clearly occupied. Another five minutes go by and I start hearing chatter outside and could feel some people moving around. I hear a knock again. At this point, I had my shirt off and my face was half shaven with mousse all over the other half. I open the door in this questionable state. To my surprise, I see three flight attendants looking terrified standing around the door. Two women and one man. So I laugh and ask them if there is a rule and a timer for how long you can use the bathroom or what exactly was going on. The man proceeds to tell me some passengers complained because they saw me go in the bathroom with my backpack. And I stayed in there a while, so they were scared something was going down and reported it to the flight crew. Mind you, it wasn't even at the questionable beard stage or anything. It had grown for some two weeks or more, give or take, just a week or more of fuzz edited to say that definitely more than a week by the way should have been clear, so I laugh some more and tell him I fully understand, but I had an important meeting upon landing, hence freshening up, and that I'll need a bit longer to just shave fully and finish grooming myself. He then excuses himself and we laugh a bit, and then he goes away. Shortly after he comes back knocking and I open, this time in a new, fresh shirt and fully shaved, and I ask, what's up? He tells me that some passengers are still concerned. I'm shaving my beard and thought I was shaving my body too since I opened the door with mousse stripping on my face and without my shirt on. I was very confused and at that stage started to get annoyed. Just let me use the damn bathroom in peace. There are many others people can use. Turns out some extremist Muslim groups do this before they get up to no good, aka sacrifice their life in an act of holy retribution, terror, whatever the hell you want to call it. Something about going to heaven freshly clean. So at this point, I'm laughing too hard, but I tell him I fully understand and that this is a good thing they check on such instances. I'd rather be safe than sorry. I then show him my meeting email with the time and date for the sake of their peace of mind. 
I also mentioned I was Christian born but not religious and that even as a Lebanese dude, I had no idea terrorists were shaving before acts of terror. Thanks for the information I didn't really need. We then had a chat outside with the rest of the flight crew, laughing and making jokes. I could tell they were still a tiny bit paranoid, but 95% apologetic. They didn't check my bag or anything, and now that I think about it, I should have shown them what was in the bag. Snacks, iPhone cables, some books, clothes, and my toiletry bag. Edits. For the many, why would you shave on the plane, queries, it was a special circumstance trip that I booked on a day's notice and my beard grows too fast. So shaving before we took off mean I'd have some annoying stubble when we landed. I wanted to look as fresh as I could for that meeting and I did what I could with the given circumstances. I also groomed myself during a lights off time where everyone is asleep. Cues to bathrooms don't form during that time. Remember, they offer you shaving kits on some business flights, so to think anyone shaving on a plane is extreme is funny, but understandable if you're unaware. They have plugs for razors, hair dryers, etc. in the plane bathroom stall. I mean, they change poopy kids in there, so think about that for a second. Reddit? Man, plane passengers are freaking ridiculous. <laughs> He did post pictures of him, or one picture with the beard, one after he shaved. And I guess with the beard, he did look kind of mean looking, but like, people need to freaking chill. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode.